Theories of Value and Behavior. Up until this point, the, the broad contributions of four major historical figures and inevitably the central characteristics inherent to the capitalist philosophy have been briefly discussed. It will be noticed that underlying these views rest assumptions of human behavior, social class relationships coupled with a metaphysical market logic where everything will, will work out just fine if certain values and a generally selfish perspective is taken by the players of the market game along with little restriction of the market itself. As a brief aside, nowhere in the writings of these thinkers, nor in the vast majority of works produced by later theorists in favor of free market capitalism, is the actual structure and process of production and distribution discussed. There is an explicit disconnect between industry and business, with the former related to the technical or scientific process of true economic unfolding with the latter only pertaining to the codified market dynamics and pursuit of profit. As will be discussed more so in a moment, a central problem inherent to the capitalist mode of production is how advancements in the, in the industrial approach, which can allow for increased problem resolution and the furthering of prosperity, have been blocked by the traditional, seemingly immutable tenets of the business approach. The latter has governed the actions of the former to the disadvantage of the former's potential. This kind of disconnect or truncated frame of reference is also to be found in other areas of focus, such as the dominant theories of labor, value, and human behavior, which inevitably serve to justify the institution of capitalism. As noted prior, the labor theory of value made popular in general by its implications via Locke Smith and Ricardo, is a generalized proposal stating that the value of a commodity is related to the labor needed to produce or obtain that commodity. As acceptable as this idea is in general form, an intuitive perspective, there are many levels of ambiguity when it comes to quantification. Many historical objections have persisted, such as how different types of labor having differing skills and wage rates could not be properly combined along with how to factor in natural resources and working investment capital itself. The growth of capital goods in the 20th century, such as machine automation of labor, also present challenges for the rather simplified labor theories concept of labor derived value since, after a certain point, the labor value inherent to production machines, which today often function to produce more machines with diminishing human effort over time, presents an ever diluted transfer of value in this context. It has been suggested by some economists today, focusing on the rapidly advancing fields of information and technological sciences, that the use of machine automation, coupled with artificial intelligence, could very well move humans out of the traditional labor force almost entirely. Suddenly, capital has become labor, so to speak. This ambiguity extends also to competing theories of value, postulated by economists, including most notably what is called the utility theory of value. While the labor theory basically takes the perspective of labor or production, the utility theory takes what we could call the market perspective, meaning that value is derived not from labor, but by the purpose or utility derived by its use, use value, by the consumer, as perceived by the consumer. French economist Jean-Baptiste Say is notable with respect to utility theory. A self-proclaimed disciple of Adam Smith, he differed with Smith on this issue of value, stating, After having shown the improvement which the science of political economy owes to Dr. Smith, it will not perhaps be useless to indicate some of the points on which he erred. To the labor of man alone he as uh, ascribes the power of producing values. This is an error. 
He goes on to explain how the exchange value or price of any good or service depends entirely on its use value or utility. He states, the value that mankind attaches to objects originates in the use it can make of them, to the inherent fitness or capability of certain things to satisfy the various wants of mankind. I shall take leave to affix the name utility. The utility of things is the groundwork of their value, and their value constitutes wealth, although price is the measure of the value of things, and their value the measure of their utility. It would be absurd to draw the inference that by forcibly raising their price, their utility can be augmented. Exchangeable value or price is an index of the recognized utility of a thing. The utility theory of value is different from the labor theory not only in its derivation of value, but also in its implication regarding a kind of subjective rationalization with respect to human decisions in the market. Utilitarianism, which has become deeply characteristic of the microeconomic assumptions put forward by neoclassical economists today, is often modeled in complex mathematical formulas in an effort to explain how humans in the market maximize their utility, specifically around the idea of increasing happiness and reducing suffering. Underlying these ideas of human behavior, as with most of economic theory itself, are again traditionalized assumptions. Economist Nassau Sr. supported a common theme reoccurring today that human wants were infinite. What we mean to state is that no person feels his whole wants to be adequately supplied. That every person has some unsatisfied desires which he believes that additional wealth would gratify. Such declarations of human nature are constant in such treatments with notions of greed, fear, and other hedonistic reflex mechanisms which assume, among other things, that material acquisition, wealth, and gain are inherent to happiness. Today, the dominant and largely accepted microeconomic perspective is that all human behavior is reducible to rational, strategic attempts to maximize either profits or gain, and to avoid pain or loss. Ever-expansive utilitarian arguments of this nature continue to be used to morally justify competitive market capitalism. One example of this is the notion of voluntarism in the suggestion that all acts in the market are never coerced and therefore everyone is free to make their own decisions for their own gain or loss. This idea is extremely common today, as though such free exchanges existed in a void with no other synergistic pressures, as though the pressures of survival in a system with clear tendencies toward basic class warfare and strategic scarcity would not generate an inherent coercion to force laborers to submit to capitalist exploitation. Overall, the utilitarian, hedonistic, and competitive and forever dissatisfied model of human nature is likely the most common defense of the capitalist system today. It is in many ways both a psychological theory of how people behave and an ethical theory of how they ought to behave arguably supporting a retroactive logic that often puts market theory before human behavioral reality, conforming the latter to the former. In reality, when the utilitarian perspective is fully considered, two serious problems emerge. First, it is virtually impossible to find predictability in such pleasure and pain boundaries after a certain degree on the social level. There is no empirical means of comparing the intensity of one individual's sense of pleasure with those of another individual beyond the very most basic assumption of wanting gain over loss. While the utility theory of value might be logical in a purely abstract, generalized view without quantification, the mechanics of such emotional dynamics are in reality susceptible to severe variation. The entire life experience of a person compared to another person 
might find some very basic common ground with respect to their personal conditioning to pleasure and pain responses. But seldom will a parallel concordance be found in any detail. Since individual pleasures are deemed the ultimate moral criteria in utilitarianism, there is really no way one can make such judgments between the pleasures of two individuals. Economist Jeremy Bentham, often considered the father of utilitarianism, actually recognized this in passing, writing, Prejudice apart, the game of pushpin is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry. If the game of pushpin furnish more pleasure, it is more valuable than either. The second problem is the short-sighted nature of the assumed emotional reaction. Human beings have historically expressed the rational interest to suffer in the present in order to gain or hope to gain in the future. Altruism, which has undergone extensive philosophical debate, might very well be rooted in forms of pleasure obtained by the selfless, painful acts for the benefit of others. As will be discussed later, the pain-pleasure premise put forward by such arguments, reinforced by an impulsive reaction for gain, has become a socially rewarded pattern. This has generated a mentality where short-term gain is sought after, often at the true expense of long-term suffering. Yet in abstraction, utilitarianism also offers a bizarre kind of equalizer since it can be identified with the perspective of mutual exchange and hence a way to always see capitalism as a system of social harmony rather than of warfare. Coming back to the labor theory versus the utility theory of value, the former clearly shows conflict as the labor theory takes into account the cost efficiency sought by the capitalists at the expense of wages for the laborers. The utility theory, on the other hand, removes these ideas overall and states that everyone is seeking the same thing and therefore, structure aside, everyone is equal. In other words, all exchanges become mutually beneficial to everyone in a narrow, absurdly abstract, generalized logic. All human actions are reduced to this system of exchange and hence, all political or social distinctions disappear in theory. The Socialist Uprising Socialism, like capitalism, has no universally accepted definition in general public conversation, but is often technically defined as an economic system characterized by social ownership of the means of production and cooperative management of the economy. The root of socialist thought appears to go back to 18th century Europe with a complex history of reformers working to challenge the emerging capitalist system. Gracchus Babo is a notable theorist in this area with his conspiracy of equals, which attempted to topple the French government. He stated society must be made to operate in such a way that it eradicates once and for all the desire of a man to become richer or wiser or more powerful than others. French socialist anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon is a famous is famous for declaring that property is theft. In his pamphlet An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government. By the early 19th century, socialist ideas were expanding rapidly, commonly in response to perceived moral and ethic problems inherent to capitalism such as class imbalance and exploitation. The list of influential thinkers is vast and complex, so only three individuals, noting their most relevant contributions, will be discussed here, William Thompson, Karl Marx, and Thorsten Veblen. William Thompson William Thompson was a powerful influence on socialist thought. He was in support of the idea of cooperatives, made famous by Robert Owen as something of an alternative to the capitalist business model, and philosophically took a utilitarian perspective when it came to human behavior. He was very influenced by Bentham, 
but his use and interpretation of utilitarianism was rather different. For instance, he believed that if all members of society were treated equally rather than engage class warfare and exploitation, they would have equal capacities to experience happiness. He argued extensively for a kind of market socialism where egalitarianism and equality prevailed. In his famous An Inquiry into the Principles of the Distribution of Wealth Most Conducive to Human Happiness, he made it clear that capitalism was a system of exploitation and insecurity. Stating, the tendency of the existing arrangement of things as to wealth is to enrich a few at the expense of the mass of producers to make the poverty of the poor more hopeless. However, he went on to recognize that even if such a hybrid of capitalism and socialism did emerge, the underlying premise of competition was still a serious problem. He wrote at length about the problems inherent to the nature of market competition outlining five issues that have been common rhetoric of socialist thought ever since. The first problem was that every laborer, artisan, and trader viewed a competitor, a rival, in every other, and each viewed a second competition, a second rivalship, between his or her profession and the public. He went on to state, it would be in the interest of all medical men that diseases should exist and prevail, or their trade would be decreased ten or one hundred fold. The second problem was the inherent oppression of women and distortion of the family, noting that the division of labor and overarching ethic of competitive selfishness further secured the drudgery of women in the household and gender inequality. The third problem associated with competition was the inherent instability, instability generated in the economy itself, stating, The third evil here imputed to the very principle of individual competition is that it must occasionally lead to unprofitable or injudicious modes of individual exertion. Every man must judge for himself as to the probability of success in the occupation which he adopts, and what are his means of judging. Everyone doing well in his calling is interested in concealing his success, lest competition should reduce his gains. What individual can judge whether the market, frequently at a great distance, sometimes in another hemisphere of the globe, is overstocked or likely to be so with the article which inclination may lead him to fabricate? And should any error of judgment lead him into an uncalled for and therefore unprofitable line of exertion, what is the consequence? A mere error of judgment may end in severe distress, if not in ruin. Cases of this sort seem to be unavoidable under the scheme of individual competition in its best form. The fourth problem noted is how the selfish nature of the competitive market presented insecurity around core life support consequences, such as security in old age, sickness, and from accidents. The fifth problem denoted by Thompson regarding market competition was that it slowed the advancement of knowledge, concealment, therefore, of what is new or excellent from competitors must accompany individual competition because the strongest personal interest is by it opposed to the principle of benevolence. Karl Marx Along with many others, Karl Marx was influenced by Thompson's work and is likely one of the most well-known economic philo philosophers today. With his name often used in derogatory manner to gesture the perils of Soviet communism, or totalitarianism, Marx is also likely the most misunderstood of all popularized economists. While most famous in the general public mind for presenting treatises on socialist communist ideas, Marx actually spent most of his time on the subject of capitalism and its operations. His contribution to understanding capitalism is more vast than many realize. 
with many common economic terms and phrases used today in conversations about capitalism, actually finding their root in Marx's literary treatments. His perspective was largely historical and featured particularly detailed scholarship about the evolution of economic thought. Due to the immense size of his work, only a few influential issues will be addressed here. One issue to denote was his awareness of how the capitalist characteristic of exchange was principled as the ultimate basis for social relationships. He stated in his Grundris, Indeed, insofar as the commodity or labor is conceived of only as exchange value, and the relation in which the various commodities are brought into connection with one another is conceived of as the exchange of these exchange values, then the individuals are simply and only conceived of as exchangers. As far as the formal character is concerned, there is absolutely no distinction between them as subjects of exchange. Their relation is therefore that of equality. Although individual A feels a need for the commodity of individual B, he does not appropriate it by force, nor vice versa, but rather they recognize one another reciprocally as proprietors. No one seizes hold of another's by force. Each divests himself of his property voluntarily. Again, as noted prior with respect to the re reoccurring theme of human relations and class assumptions or denials, Marx emphasized what could be argued as three core delusions, the delusion of freedom, equality, and social harmony, as reduced to an extremely narrow association around the idea of mutually beneficial exchange, which was to be the only real economic relationship by which the whole of society is to be assessed. <clears throat> Quote, it is in the character of the money relation, as far as it is developed in its purity to this point, and without regard to more highly developed relations of production, that all inherent contradictions of bourgeois society appear extinguished in money relations as conceived in a simple form. And bourgeois democracy, even more than bourgeois economists, takes refuge in this aspect in order to construct apologetics for the existing economic relations." End quote. His work Capital, a Critique of Political Economy, Marx extensively analyzes many factors of the capitalist system, namely the nature of commodities themselves, the dynamics between value, use, use value, exchange value, labor theory, and utility along with a deep investigation of what capital means, how the system evolved, and ultimately the nature of roles within the model. An important theme to denote is his view regarding surplus value, which in gesture of Ricardo's labor theory of value is the assumed value appropriated by the capitalist in the form of profit, which is in excess of the value or cost inherent to labor or production itself. He stated with, with respect to dismissing this surplus origin in exchange, <clears throat> turn and twist then as we may, the fact remains unaltered. If equivalents are exchanged, no surplus value results, and if non-equivalents are exchanged, still no surplus value results. Circulation or the exchange of commodities begets no value. He then argues in short, differentiating between labor and labor, labor power, with the latter consisting of both a use value and an exchange value, that a worker is only compensated for meeting his needs for subsistence, which is represented in his wages, while everything past that value is a surplus, which theoretically translates into the profit made by the capitalist, finalized by the price markup in market exchange. This point, which he further extends in context and dynamics inherent to the circulation and application of different forms of capital, 
capital defined still as a means of production, but in this case mostly in its monetary form, poses the conclusion that an exploitation of the workers was inherent to the creation of surplus value or profit. In other words, by implication, this was a form of basic inequality built into the capitalist system, and as long as one small group of owners control the surplus value created by the working class, there will always be rich and poor, wealth and poverty. Marx further extends this idea to a reassessment of property, which was essentially now the legal foundation of capital itself, explicitly allowing for the coercive expro expropriation of surplus labor, that part of labor which generates the surplus value, stating, at first, the rights of property seem to us to be based on a man's own labor. At least some such assumption was necessary since only commodity owners with equal rights confronted each other and the sole means by which a man could become possessed of the commodities of others was by alienating or giving up his own commodities and these could be replaced by labor alone. Now, however, property turns out to be the right on the part of the capitalist to appropriate the unpaid labor, surplus labor, of others or its product, and to be the impossibility on the part of the laborer of appropriating his own product. The separation of property from labor has become the necessary consequence of a law that apparently originated in their identity. Marx develops these kinds of arguments extensively in his writing, including the idea that working class labor cannot be voluntary in this system, only coercive, since the ultimate decision to apply labor for a wage was in the hands of the capitalist. He stated, the worker therefore only feels himself outside his work, and in his work feels outside himself. He is at home when he is not working, and when he is working, he is not at home. His labor is therefore not voluntary, but coerced. It is forced labor. It is therefore not the satisfaction of a need. It is merely a means to satisfy needs external to it. In the end, it was this complex, multifaceted degradation, exploitation, and dehumanization of the average worker that bothered him so and pushed him toward reform he even invented a phrase, the law of the increasing misery, to describe how the general working population's happiness was inverse to the accumulation of wealth for the capitalist class. In the end, Marx was convinced that pressures inherent to the system would push the working class to revolt against the capitalist class, allowing for a new socialist mode of production where, in part, the working class operated for their own benefit. Thorsten Veblen will be the final so-called socialist whose influential ideas regarding the development and flaws of capitalism will be explored here. Like Marx, he had the advantage of time with respect to the digestion of economic history. Veblen taught economics at a number of universities during his time, prolifically producing literature on various social issues. Veblen was very critical of the neoclassical economic assumptions, specifically regarding that all human economic behavior was to be reduced to a hedonistic interplay of self-maximization and preservation as absurdly simplistic. He took what we could call an evolutionary view of human history, with change defined by the social institutions that took hold or were surpassed, he stated with respect to the current, what he deemed materialistic, state of the time. Like all human culture, this material civilization is a scheme of institutions, institutional fabric and institutional growth. The growth of culture is a cumulative sequence of habituation and the ways and means of it are the habitual response of human nature to exigencies that vary incontinently, cumulatively, 
but with something of a consistent sequence in the cumulative variations that so go forward. Incontinently, because each new move creates a new situation which induces a further new variation in the habitual manner of response. Cumulatively, because each new situation is a variation of what has gone before it and embodies as causal factors all that has been affected by what went before, consistently because the underlying traits of human nature, propensities, aptitudes, and whatnot, by force of which the response takes place and on the ground of which the habituation takes effect, remain substantially unchanged. End quote. Veblen challenged the basic foundation of the capitalist mode of production by questioning many of the factors that have been essentially given or deemed empirical by the centuries of economic debate. The now ingrained institutions of wages, rents, property, interest, labor were distributed in their supposed simplicity by a view that none of them could be held as intellectually viable outside of the purely categorical association with extreme limits of application. He joked about how a gang of Aleutian Islanders slushing about in the rack and surf with rakes and magical incantations for the capture of shellfish are held in point of taxonomic reality to be engaged in a feat of hedonistic equilibration in rent, wages, and interest. And that is all there is to it. He saw production and industry itself as a social process where lines were deeply blurred, as it invariably involved the sharing of knowledge, usufruct, and skills. In many ways, he viewed such categorical characteristics of capitalism to be inherent to capitalism alone and not representative of physical reality. Hence a vast contrivance. He found that the dominant neoclassical theory existed in part to obscure the fundamental class warfare and hostility inherent to further secure the interests of what he called the vested interests or absentee owners a.k.a. capitalists. He rejected the idea that private property was a natural right, as assumed by Locke, Smith, and the others, often joking about the absurdity of thought that leads the absentee owners to claim ownership of commodities produced, in reality by the labor of the common worker, highlighting the absurdity of the long-held principle that from labor comes property. He went further to express the inherent social nature of production and how the true nature of skill and knowledge accumulation completely voided the assumption of property rights in and of itself. Stating, this natural rights theory of property makes the creative effort of an isolated, self-sufficing individual the basis of ownership vested in him. In so doing, it overlooks the fact that there is no isolated, self-sufficing individual. Production takes place only in society, only through the cooperation of an industrial community. This industrial community may be large or small, but it always comprises a group large enough to contain and transmit the traditions, tools, technical knowledge, and usages, without which there can be no industrial organization and no economic relation of individuals to one another or to their environment. There can be no production without technical knowledge, hence no accumulation and no wealth to be owned in severalty or otherwise. And there is no technical knowledge apart from an industrial community, since there is no individual production and no individual productivity the natural rights preconception reduces itself to absurdity even under the logic of its own assumptions. As with Marx, he saw no other way to distinguish the two major classes of society than between those who work and those who exploit that work. With the profit-making portion of capitalism, the business, completely separate from production itself, industry, he makes a clear distinction 
between business and industry and refers to the former as functioning as a vehicle of sabotage for industry. He saw a complete contradiction between the ethical content of the general community to produce efficiently and with high service and the laws of private property that had the power to direct industry for the sake of profit alone, reducing that efficiency and intent. The term sabotage in this context was defined by Veblen as the conscientious withdrawal of efficiency. He states, the industrial plant is increasingly running idle or half idle, running increasingly short of its productive capacity. Workmen are being laid off and all the while these people are in great need of all sorts of goods and services which these idle plants and idle workmen are fit to produce. But for reasons of business expediency, it is impossible to let these idle plants and idle workmen go to work. That is to say, for reasons of insufficient profit to the business, men interested, or in other words, for the reasons of insufficient income to the vested interests. Furthermore, Veblen, as opposed to the vast majority of people in the modern day who condemn acts of corruption on ethical grounds, did not see any of the problems of abuse and exploitation as an issue of morality or ethics. He saw the problems as inherent, built into the nature of capitalism itself. He states, it is not that these captains of big business whose duty it is to administer this salutary modicum of sabotage on production are naughty. It is not that they aim to shorten human life or augment human discomfort by contriving an increase of privation among their fellow men. The question is not whether this traffic in privation is humane, but whether it is sound business management. With respect to the nature of government, Veblen's view was very clear. Government, by its very political construct, existed to protect the existing social order and class structure, reinforcing private property laws and, by direct extension, reinforcing the disproportionate ownership ruling class. Legislation, police surveillance, the administration of justice, the military and diplomatic service all are chiefly concerned with business relations, pecuniary interests, and they have little more than an incidental bearing on other human interests, he stated. The idea of democracy was also deeply violated by capitalist power in his view, stating constitutional government is a business government. Veblen, while aware of the phenomenon of lobbying and the buying of politicians commonly seen today as a form of corruption, did not see this as the real nature of the problem. Rather, government control by business was not an anomaly. It was simply what government had manifested to be by design by its very nature as an institutionalized means for social control. Government would always protect the rich against the poor. Since the poor always greatly outnumbered the rich, a rigid legal structure favoring the wealthy, propertied interests had to exist to keep the class separation and benefit to the capitalist interests intact. Likewise, he also recognized how the capitalist state government very much needed to keep social values in line with their interests. What Veblen called a pecuniary culture. Therefore, the predatory, selfish, and competitive habits typical of success in the underlying social warfare inherent to the capitalist system naturally reinforced those values by default. To be giving and vulnerable was of little use to success in this context, as the ruthless and strategically competitive were icons of social reward. In a broad assessment, Veblen worked to critically analyze the core structure and values of the capitalist model, posing what could be argued as some profoundly sociologically advanced conclusions with respect to its inherent contradictions technical inefficiency and value disorders. His work is very much encouraged for review by all interested in the history of economic thought, specifically for those skeptical of the premise of the free market.
In conclusion, capitalism as social pathology. The history of economic thought is, in many ways, the history of human social relationships with the pattern of certain mere assumptions gaining prominence to the effect of being considered sacrosanct and immutable over time. This element of traditionalism, culminating from values and belief systems of earlier periods, has been a core theme in this short review of economic history, the central point being that the attributes taken as given to the dominant theories of economy today are actually not based on direct physical support, such as would be needed to find validation via the method of science, but rather based on the mere perpetuation of an established ideological framework, which has evolved to the intricately self-refer to its internal logic, justifying its own existence by its own standards. Today it is not what embodies the capitalist ideology and specifics that is most problematic, but rather what it omits by extension. Just as early religions saw the world as flat and had to adjust their rhetoric once it was proven round by science, the tradition of market economics is faced with similar trials. Considering the simplicity of the agrarian and eventually primitive approaches to industrial production, there was little awareness or needed concern about its possible negative consequences over time on not only the habitat, ecological level, but also on the human level, public health. Likewise, the market system with its very old assumptions regarding possibility also ignores or even fights the powerful breakthroughs in science and technology that express capacities to solve problems and create elevated prosperity. In fact, as will be explored in the essay Market Efficiency versus Technical Efficiency, such progressive actions and harmonious recognitions regarding the habitat and human well-being reveals that market capitalism literally cannot facilitate these solutions, since its very mechanics disallow or work against such possibilities by default. Generally speaking, the resolution of problems and hence increasing of efficiency is, in many ways, anathema to the market's operation. Solving problems in general means no more ability to gain income from the servicing of those problems. New efficiencies almost always mean a reduction of labor and energy needs, and while that may seem positive with respect to true earthly efficiency, it also often means a loss of jobs and reduction of monetary circulation upon its application. It is here where the capitalist model begins to take the role of a social pathogen, not only with respect to what it ignores, disallows, or fights against by design, but also with respect to what it reinforces and perpetuates. If we go back to Locke's statement about how the nature of money given its tacit consent by the community, was to essentially serve as a community in and of itself, it is easy to see how this once mere medium of exchange has evolved into its present sociological form, where the entire basis of the market serves, in fact, not with the intent to create and assist with human survival, health, and prosperity, but to now merely facilitate the act of profit and profit alone. Adam Smith never would have fathomed that in the present day the most lucrative, rewarded fields would, would be not the production of life-supporting, improving goods, but rather the act of moving money around, hence the work of financial institutions such as banks, Wall Street, and investment firms, firms that literally create nothing but hold immense wealth and influence. Today, the only real value theory in place is what could be called the money sequence of value. Money has taken on a life of its own with respect to the reinforced psychology moving it. It has no direct purpose in intent but to work to manifest more money out of less money, investment.
This money-seeking money phenomenon has not only created a value system disorder where this interest in monetary gain trumps everything, leaving truly relevant environmental and public health issues secondary and external to the focus of economy. Its constant propensity to multiply and expand truly has a cancerous quality. Where this idea of needed growth rather than steady state balance, continues its pathological effect on many levels. Much could be said about the debt system and how it virtually, and how virtually all the countries on the planet Earth are now indebted to themselves to the extent where we, the human species, actually do not have the money in circulation to pay ourselves back from what we have borrowed out of thin air. The need for more and more credit to fuel the market is constant today due to this imbalance, which means, like cancer, we are dealing with an intent of infinite expansion and consumption. This simply cannot work on a finite planet. Furthermore, the scarcity-driven competitive ethos inherent to the model continues to perpetuate divisive class warfare that keeps not only the world at war, with itself via empire imperialism and protectionism, but also within the general population. Today most walk around afraid of each other since exploitation and abuse is the dominant rewarded ethos. All humans have adapted in this culture unnecessarily to see each other as threats to one's own survival in increasingly abstract economic contexts. For example, when two people walk into a job interview seeking life support, they are not interested in the well-being of the other, since only one will gain the job. In fact, empathic sensitivities are negative pressures in this system of, of advantage and go completely unrewarded by the financial mechanism. Likewise, the assumption that fairness could ever exist in such a competitive environment particularly when the nature of winning and losing means a loss of life support or survival is a deeply naive ideal. The legal statutes in existence that work to stop monopoly laws and financial corruption exist because there is literally no built-in safeguard for such so-called corruption in this model. As implied by Smith and Veblen in this essay, the state is really a manifestation of the economic premise and not the other way around, the use of state power for legislation to ensure the security and prosperity of one class over another is not a distortion of the capitalist system. It is a core feature of the free market competitive ethic. <clears throat> Many in the libertarian, laissez-faire, Austrian school, Chicago school, and other neoclassical offshoots constantly tend to talk about how state interference is the problem today, such as with having protectionist import-export policy or the favoring of certain industries by the state. It is assumed that somehow the market can be free to operate without the manifestation of monopoly or the corruptions inherent to what has been deemed today crony capitalism, even though the entire basis of strategy is competitive or in more direct terms, warring. Again, to assume the state would not be used as a tool for differential advantage, a tool for business, is absurd. In the end, these overtly and unnecessarily selfish values have been at the root of human conflict since their inception, and as noted, the historical notion of human warfare on the class level is seen by most as given, natural, or immutable. In the existing social model extracted from an inherently scarcity-driven, xenophobic, and racist frame of reference, there is no such thing as peace or balance. It simply isn't possible in the capitalist model. Likewise, the illusion of equality between people in the so-called democratic societies also persists, assuming that somehow political equality can manifest out of the explicit economic inequality inherent to this mode of production and human relations. Early in this essay, the distinction between the historical and mechanistic view of economic logic was mentioned in passing. 
the importance of the mechanistic scientific perspective which will be explored in later essays is critical with respect to understanding how deeply out of date and flawed the, the market economy really is. When we take the known laws of nature, both on the human and habitat levels, and start to calculate what our options and possibilities are, technically, without the baggage of such historical assumptions, a very different train of thought emerges. In the view of TZM, this is the new world view by which humanity needs to align in order to solve its current mounting sociological and ecological problems, along with opening the door to enormous possibilities for future prosperity.